uh, I would take apart the computers and try to make robots. And, you know, every so often I would try to put something back together <laughs> after I got in trouble for breaking it. I was very, very unsuccessful at that. I think the first thing that I actually successfully got to work, I was probably about nine or 10 years old. And I built a gas powered remote control car from scratch, which was a big accomplishment for me. It was a... Uh, this is the cool thing in my uh, in the neighborhood because the older guys in my neighborhood, a lot of them were into street racing, like illegal street racing, Fast and Furious style before the movie. And for kicks, they would they would make the model version, the gas powered model version of the cars that they would race. And I loved hanging out with them, and I was determined to build my own car to race with them. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Jamie. I'm Amy, and this is Clever. And today we've got Eni Archibong. Eni is an emerging product designer currently working out of Basel, Switzerland. You may remember his name from a previous episode of Clever because we talked about him with Terry Crews in episode seven. They collaborated on a furniture collection together. Eni was born and raised in Pasadena, California, and studied architecture and industrial design at Art Center College of Design. After Art Center, Eni moved to Switzerland where he got his master's in luxury from École Cantonale d'Art de Lausanne. He's exhibited globally at galleries, museums, and design shows, and has also been featured in Metropolis, Surface, Architectural Digest, and other print and digital publications. And he's done work for brands such as Hermes, Bernhardt, Herman Miller, and various European luxury brands. So let's talk to Eni. My name is Ini Archibong. I live in Reinach, Basel Landschaft, which is near the city of Basel. And I'm a designer, industrial designer, uh, spatial designer, and sometimes artist. And I do what I do for the culture and to advance things. I would like to know first about your upbringing, because I understand your parents came to the U.S. from Nigeria. Is that right? Yeah. 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 So how, what was it like growing up there? How old were you when you came to the U S? Well, I was actually born in the U S my parents came for college and, uh, and stayed. So even though I have Nigerian heritage, I, I grew up, uh, in America as an American, but, uh, funny oh, enough, where, mom, where did they move to when they came over? Where were you, where did you grow up? I grew up in Pasadena, but uh-huh. my parents, my dad went to Columbia and my mom went to Rutgers So they were on the East Coast until they moved to California and had me. Can you tell us about your childhood and what it was like growing up in Pasadena with Nigerian heritage and being an American and all that sort of cocktail of stuff going on? My mom always used to say, um, out there, you're in America, but when you're in the house, you're in Nigeria. (laughs) I was definitely raised uh, as a Nigerian child and... um, We had a very tight knit Nigerian community in L.A. also growing up. I mean, a lot of my closest friends to this day, you know, we were we grew up together, you know, seeing each other every weekend and celebrating birthdays and weddings and holidays all together. So, you know, we had a very strong cultural upbringing, even though we were living in the States and they made it a point to make sure that we knew about our our heritage. That's nice. And I imagine you probably had friends your age, too, who were also Nigerian-American and dealing with all that that comes up with that. So you had people to bounce stuff off of or a shared experience, I guess, is probably. Yeah, definitely. And and because, you know, we had actually my older brother is, is two years older than me. So within our age group, you know, we had a lot of other Nigerian kids our age that we grew up with. And, um, you know, it's really cool now because, you know, we're all adults and doing our different things throughout the world and uh, keeping up with each other on social media and seeing each other when we're back home visiting. And, you know, at special occasions, we always see each other and our parents are still in touch and they still hang out with each other. So it's a strong community. Were you like a creative kid? Did your creativity start at an early age? And if so, how did it manifest? I was always a creative kid. I didn't realize it until I was much older. (laughs) As a young kid, 
I did a lot of things that were probably indicators of what I would do later in life. Uh, I always liked to draw. I had a pretty vivid imagination. One of the things that I used to do back then that used to drive my parents crazy is I would try to take things apart and combine them with mm -hmm. other things to turn them into <laughs> magical creations, <laughs> you know, like a... I would take apart a calculator and remote control car, you know, toy and think that I was creating some sort of hybrid robot of some sort or like, <laughs> like transformers, a natural exactly. synthesizer. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I took everything apart. <laughs> yeah. That would cause some consternation amongst the, amongst the authority figures. Did anything you took apart and tried to combine actually work? No. <laughs> But you learned a lot about how things were put together and about what made them work. And that's the best definitely. way to learn is to take things apart. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, I'm trying to think what one of the crazy, like, so I grew up in like a very computer focused family. My dad's an engineer. My mom's a computer scientist. So we always had old computers around the house. You know, every time there was a, a new advancement in computers, we would get a new computer. So then the, the previous one would be sitting there. So I would take apart the computers and try to make robots. And, you know, every so often I would try to put something back together <laughs> after I got in trouble for breaking it. I was very, very unsuccessful at that. I think the first thing that I actually successfully got to work, I was probably about nine or 10 years old. And I built a gas powered remote control car from scratch, which was a big accomplishment for me. It was, a, yeah. it was the cool thing in my uh, in the neighborhood because the older guys in my neighborhood, a lot of them were into street racing, like illegal street racing, Fast and Furious style before the movie. And for kicks, they would they would make the model version, the gas powered model version of the cars that they would race. And I loved hanging out with them. And I was determined to build my own car to race with them <laughs> oh man that's so cool i yeah. love the generational interplay there too and it's also sort of quasi illegal so there's like all kinds of boundaries you're trespassing on and i love it yeah definitely i learned a lot <laughs> of illegal things from those guys <laughs> <laughs> and were your parents supportive of this at the same time just trying to mitigate the damage um i don't know if supportive is the right word <laughs> Oh, okay. They were, they were definitely, well, they were supportive of stuff like building the car, for example, mm -hmm. the remote control car, stuff that was, you know, focused and, and not damaging of their property. They were very into. <laughs> okay. And, that makes sense. <laughs> and of course, my dad's an engineer. So I think there's like a, a bit of pride that came from watching me do something mechanical like that. They were very supportive of my brothers and I in a lot of ways, even though the art stuff the creative stuff is definitely not their bag mm. they my dad he's an engineer it's funny he makes the same joke every time um i tell him that i've designed a new table he's like you still haven't figured out how to make it flat <laughs> <laughs> like like chief yeah that's uh yeah that's such an engineering <laughs> joke <laughs> exactly but they're supportive nonetheless when i was young with you know the the drawing and stuff like that they, you know, they weren't really, wasn't that they weren't supportive. They just didn't get it. And, and then when I started drawing graffiti, it was a little bit different. Oh. And then, <laughs> yeah. So the graffiti, was that in the teenage years? Cause I mean, that's usually when we're struggling to really shape our identities and sometimes pushing back against what our parents understand about us. Yes. It's, I mean, it started, it was very short lived, first of all. Well, actually, it started when I was 11 because I remember distinctly when I first wanted to try my hand. There was somebody at my old school that was really good and just started, you know, writing my name and drawing during class because that was the other thing is I did most of my drawing when I was supposed to be paying attention in class. And um, by the time I was 12, you know, I started at a new school and I was taking a bus to the other side of Pasadena. That was when, you know, the bus tagging type of stuff started happening. I wasn't like a Picasso. I was more like L.A. street graffiti. <laughs> and most of my really good stuff stayed in the sketchbook. And I did that all the way through high school. I was always writing in the sketchbook and stuff like that because it was like the friends I had that were out there bombing, you know, would be getting in trouble and my parents were not with that at all. 
<laughs> but in terms of the teenage years and your sort of burgeoning creativity, mm-hmm. did you have to find some edges and some boundaries to push against? Or did you have any times that you felt kind of lost and not sure what to do? Yeah, like in the teenage years, again, the the art, it really started yeah, around 12. And the art wasn't a rebellion thing for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, not until a little bit later it really started with just being exposed to art because like I said before I started at the new school I started a school called Polytechnic which was in Pasadena it's one of like the elite prep schools and they had a lot of resources so there was a very strong arts department and they you know were into having very well-rounded students so prior to that the only art I ever saw was was the graffiti on the freeway. And that was kind of my, my world. And also like in my neighborhood, there were also a lot of low rider cars that, that guys would, uh, would soup up. And to me, that was like, you know, luxury art, all of that, you know, beauty. And then when I started at the new school, they had a computer lab and I started doing pottery. And that was really what got me into art was throwing pottery and I was doing digital art when I was like 12 and I was obsessed with back then it was like the earliest Photoshop (laughs) and (laughs) like the first 3D programs I started on like uh, KPT Bryce and Ray Dream Designer and a lot of programs that don't exist anymore so that was really the start for me and and it wasn't rebellious because it was very encouraged at the school it didn't turn into a rebellion until I was in high school and I got pretty good grades, but I was a horrible student. I used to get in a lot of trouble because, you know, I was hyperactive and I didn't do well controlling my impulses, we'll say. <laughs> so uh, I got you give a, us an example. Examples, like too many to name. Technically, I've been, I, they've tried to kick me out of every school that I've been to except for where I got my master's. <laughs> Is this just you doing whatever your attention pulls you to not controlling your impulses or were you acting out? Uh, it wasn't really acting out. Yeah, I was just not controlling my impulses. So one thing is that I, I learned in a very particular way and I was able to learn very quickly. I basically got 100 percent on almost any test I took back then and I would digest the information in my own way. So I didn't have to pay attention like the other students and I couldn't concentrate to do homework. So I would just be in class kind of uh, drawing and getting in trouble because the teacher doesn't think I'm paying attention and then repeating everything that they had said since the beginning of the class verbatim like a tape recorder. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you Damn know, it, I, too, too smart for this system. <laughs> yeah, almost. <laughs> Except I didn't figure out how to work the system. <laughs> okay. so a lot of time in the principal's office. Um, yeah, I think the first time I went to the principal's office, I was in kindergarten and uh, I went for cursing. So at what point did you discover music? Because I understand you were heavily involved in the L.A. beat scene. Yeah, I, I was actually I started music when I was nine or ten. And my parents, again, they didn't understand. I just out of the blue requested a piano and, and they got like an old used out of tune piano and I tinkered around on it. When I was old enough to be in the elementary orchestra at my old school, I asked for a flute and I started playing the flute and I advanced pretty quickly in that to the point where they moved me with the older orchestra. And I think eventually I was first flute before I left that school. And when I was 12, I started the new school and the kids made fun of me because I played the flute. So I switched to the saxophone to be a bit more masculine, I guess. (laughs) And then I played the saxophone for a few years. And then when I got to high school, I realized that uh, popularity points don't go to the band members as much as they go to the athletes. So (laughs) I concentrated more on sports and put the instruments down. And then I didn't start making music again until I dropped out slash got told to leave USC. (laughs) And (laughs) then I started making music again. (laughs) Your poor parents, they must have been like so (laughs) pulling their hair out with like being so proud and so concerned. (laughs) Yeah, I think so. I think my mom still goes through that. <laughs> okay. 
yeah, that was, I've always had the musical stuff in me. And then, uh, I've always had like sort of this, this tumultuous, um, existence, I guess, because, uh, I don't know, there was definitely a feeling of not fitting with, uh, the world around me for the majority of my life. Um, mm. probably until my twenties, mm-hmm. until I, until I made a decision to be an artist and, damn what anybody else would think (laughs) and up until that point it was it was pretty rough in a lot of ways i can relate to that there's you know hopes and dreams your parents have for you and then there's all this stuff that society is trying to corral you into and until you give yourself the permission to be an artist and then embark on that really difficult journey in itself you're in this pattern of justifying your own creativity or trying to find a reason to justify it and it's it's not supported necessarily so you're not sure how much gas to give it yeah and you know the the funny thing is in retrospect when i left usc and i was forced to to really think about what i was going to do that was when it became clear to me i guess i never compromised doing my creative thing i just kept it to myself like in high school i I basically i can't believe i'm saying this on something that's going to be uh (laughs) made public but i used to call into school pretending to meet my dad and tell them that I was going to be late and miss like the first half of the day pretty often. And uh, I would get to school in the morning and go straight to the ceramic studio and I would throw pottery until lunchtime. (laughs) And then I would go and hang out with my friends at lunch and then go to the second half of classes so that I could be (laughs) eligible to go to my sports practices after school. (laughs) I love that you cut class to throw pottery. (laughs) (laughs) The funny thing is the ceramics teacher, he was like one of two of my first creative mentors. He taught me a lot about not only art and life. Shout out to Stuart Freed. He was a pretty well-known ceramicist. And I think he still is. He taught me a lot of life lessons through the craft, you know, certain things like um, relishing the journey over the destination you know Mm, that's a good one i remember one time i used to run the kiln so i would uh i would throw these like really big pots i was getting to a point where i was getting pretty good but you know if you ever have done pottery if you're not patient you know you can get air bubbles within your big pieces of clay that you're throwing and then they'll explode in the kiln so i was having pots that kept exploding and i was frustrated he came in and he saw i was frustrated and i told him about it and then he just like sat down and he threw just like probably one of the most amazing pots i I could never imagine to have thrown that moment and then he just like smashed it rolled it up into a ball of clay and then threw another one (laughs) and he just kept doing it he's like who cares you know it's about doing it and not about what you're going to get from it and um you know, he taught me a lot of lessons like that. And, and you know, in the midst of, uh, you know, breaking the bongs that I would make and try to fire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was a super, super cool guy. And he was the only person I think that knew that I was uh, cutting class to be in there. He never snitched. <laughs> <laughs> that's nice to have an ally like that a kind of a partner in crime a sensei of sorts who knows you're breaking the rules a little bit but it's for your own good so he lets it happen yeah yeah and uh, you know of course he was like he was a proper teacher he he turned somewhat of a blind eye but vocally he always told me to do what I was supposed to do. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yes. That's awesome. I want to go back to what you said. So you said you left USC. So what happened after that? Because I know you went to a couple of different places after that. So how did you get to the master's degree? Uh, From USC to the master's degree. Wow. That's a journey. So (laughs) (laughs) fasten your seatbelt. So USC, I was there for two years. I had a presidential scholarship. I had almost all of my tuition plus all of my books and stuff like that. And, you know, to have one of those presidential, I think it was like the business scholars thing. It was pretty strict 
what classes you had to take. So, you know, I went in orientation and they basically laid out, you know, four years of my life with all this, like, like accounting, econ, all this this oh, kind of stuff. That's my version of hell. Yeah, it was mine too. And uh, I barely made it through like the general intro stuff before I um, stopped taking the classes that were required of me and started walking in on and sitting in on classes that I either wasn't registered for or wasn't supposed to be taking but managed to register for. So I was taking like a bunch of philosophy and art classes and not doing my required classes and um, also getting in a bit of trouble here and there with the campus security, but nothing major. <laughs> At the end of the day, it was it was a matter of having the choice of, you know, going back and taking a semester off and getting things together and then coming back and restarting all of that. Once I stopped, I just kind of examined my life. I wasn't wasn't happy with where I was. You know, I, w I didn't feel like I was with my tribe, so to speak. You know, I had my roommate who at the time was like my, my best friend. You know, we would talk about these things and I was also getting very into uh, esoteric sort of spiritual stuff and philosophy and really developing a perspective. And because of all these things, I started to really examine who I was and why what I was doing wasn't matching and why I felt like I'm sort of out of place kind of my whole life. I then really came to the conclusion that I needed to focus inward, especially when it came to judging myself, that it needed to come from me and not from outside and not from what anyone else thinks and feeling like a failure based on what other people's standards were didn't make sense and that you know i wouldn't be failing unless i was failing by my standards on what was important to me that's a powerful place to get to i wish that i had gotten to it as early as you did it's pretty life shattering when you're like 20 years old yeah but at the same time very liberating because the conclusion i came to was to look back and look at what i was doing and it made me realize what had been constant and consistent. And the one thing that had followed me through my life was my creativity. I mean, even during this time at USC, I spent my free time building 3D models of like space architecture <laughs> and <laughs> rendering them. This is so nerdy. <laughs> and <laughs> rendering them and printing them out on 11 by 17s and stuffing them in a folder in my apartment. <laughs> I stopped going to USC. I enrolled in art classes and you know I didn't know what I was going to do, but you know, all I knew is that I was going to do what I enjoyed. So I just went and I registered for ceramics classes and started making music again. I got Fruity Loops on my computer and Reason and started teaching myself how to make beats and doing art and reading spiritual books and kind of going down a spiritual path that led me to the conclusion that for me to feel satisfied with my life, I had to be on a path where I was trying to change the world for the better through the skills that I've been given. I decided to actually at that point try to become an architect. That's a that's a powerful realization. You, you sort of had to crack your sense of self into many pieces and rebuild it on your own terms. Then you have to forge a path and get everybody else who's trying to support you on board with that. <laughs> yeah. Start. Yeah, I mean, that's not always that easy. Did you start by going to architecture school or, or how did you start pursuing architecture? No, actually. So, so at that point, like you said, getting other people on board is not so easy. So my approach to it was to pretend like I was still in school. <laughs> I basically stayed with my old roommate who let me slide on the on the rent until I was able to take care of it. And I just started getting books on architecture. I just started looking at architects that I liked and started drawing some of my ideas and making beats. I was 
at the time very very heavily focused on the effect of the spiritual geometry that has been passed down through the ages so i was reading a lot of manly p hall and learning about the pythagoreans and trying to understand what the makeup was of geometry was and how it affected people and why we use the geometry that we use and looking into like euclidean geometry and things like that and just sketching ideas and thinking about that and you know coming up with a lot of unrealistic ideas of spaces and how they could affect people's spirits and reading a lot about cathedrals getting into the gothic architecture and then there came a point where i didn't really have a choice but to move back home <laughs> <laughs> and while i was at home there also came a point where I had to get a job and my parents were really like, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. So funny enough, I was in uh, South Pasadena taking my mom to do something, run an errand. So I dropped my mom off and I'm walking on Mission Street and thinking to myself with my sketchbook, because I always had my sketchbook and I walked past this space, you know, it wasn't, wasn't like an office space, but it's more like a storefront. And it was all glass and there was a man inside hunched over a table and on the window it said George Architecture and I walked past it and then I doubled back and I turned around and walked in and he was like, can I help you? <laughs> and I just said, I think I want to be an architect, but I don't know what that means and what it takes and what goes into it. Can I ask you some questions? And like any self-respecting middle-aged architect, he said, can't you see I'm fucking busy? <laughs> 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 he said, uh, if you want to talk to me, I go to Buster's every morning around 7 a.m. before I start work. If you want to talk to me, then meet me there. So the next morning I went and I met him and he said that he liked that I carried his sketchbook, even though the drawings were crap. <laughs> <laughs> and he invited me to the office and you know at the point where i was thinking hey you think i could like work for you or something <laughs> he was like you're of no use to me you'll only get in the way but i've got an extra computer if you come in here promptly and don't get in the way you can use the books on the bookshelf and try to figure out this cad program and if at some point you make yourself useful then you can have a job <laughs> It's pretty crazy. So yeah, it took a couple of weeks because like I said, I started using pretty complex 3D programs from the age of 12. So I had an approach to software. I never tried to learn how to execute something. I tried to figure out the way that the software's brain operates because then you can find anything. But if you keep searching around, like, how am I going to find how to, like, what do I push to draw a line? You're never going to figure out how to draw a line. And then you're just going to figure out how to draw a line. So, you know, I tried to get into the brain of CAD. And once I started to figure out, you know, how it moves and how it thinks, I started drawing some of the things that I found in the Frank Ching books. Frank Ching is like the, he was like the authority on architectural drawing from like, like way, way back, like old architects learn how to draw from Frank Ching. So he had all of these books. So I would draw plan sections and elevations of typical balloon frame housing and stuff like that. And then I was getting better. He started giving me assignments like to draw the cabinets in the office. And then he'd give me like floor plans of an old project and then have me extrapolate elevations and sections off of them. And after a couple of weeks, you know, I proved useful. So I ended up working for him for about two and a half years, almost three years. I was making music at night and being an architect's apprentice during the day, you know, only educated on the job and in the field. He used to take me after I drew something, he would take me to the construction site, show me the reality of what I had drawn. He taught me how to think really, really, really think beyond the lines and how to see things in the world and then abstract them into the lines and take them apart in my head. Yeah, he gave me the foundations of everything that I do now. His name is Tony George South Pass. You should go find him. Yeah, I want to I want to buy him a cup of coffee yeah, really. really to say thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I actually I see him whenever I go home. Oh, that's um, so nice. <laughs> Yeah, and he's like, he's super, super proud. He like, I showed him what I was doing and he put it on his website. 
Oh, well, uh, yeah, he, he made a major investment in you. He did. He did. I mean, it's not like he paid me handsomely, but <laughs> <laughs> honestly, if he hadn't taken that chance on me, I don't know what my path would have looked like because it was in a moment where I was completely lost. You know, he not only gave me an income and the ability to move into my own apartment, <laughs> but also the education and the the fact that somebody, you know, believed in me and was willing to bet on me and trusted me. I think that was a big thing because we did get to a point where he would show up with sketches of his ideas and he drew amazingly, like, uh, like a madman. Like the way that he would draw, I would be able to take his sketches from napkins or a sketchbook and then start making, you know, a full building out of it. One of the things that he really taught me was a way of, of thinking of, um, subtracting to the essential in your thought process. He could do a sketch of like the overall, this is what the house should look like. And these are the important, but um, you know, there's also like the, what is essential about making it have the feeling that it has in his sketch, you know, and those he would break out in, into his, his sketch details, which would be very well thought out and articulate and clear. So like with a Spanish home, you look at the sketch of what the facade looks like and, you know, you don't necessarily know what you're liking about it. But then when he would break out the detail, he would show me like in order to achieve this, we're going to need to make sure that the walls are really thick and the windows are deeply inset and like all these different things really, he showed me how to articulate those things pretty clearly in, in his drawings and got me to a point where I could achieve quite a bit just from his sketches. That's an incredible story. I'm like, <laughs> my jaw's on the floor, but just because you were able to just walk in one day and meet this person who basically gave you an opportunity, but also gave you the confidence that you could do something with this ability that had been like haunting you yeah. throughout your childhood. So that, that's fascinating. What, what was the next, like, what did you do after you worked for him for three years? Did you decide to go back to school? Yeah. That's what I did. So, um, you know, while I was working with him and he, as he had his own way of being encouraging, I will just say that I appreciated it a lot more later, but he was, mm -hmm. he was pretty hard. You know, he really didn't, he, he didn't allow me to take it easy on myself. And, you know, we've had conversations about that afterward. He was pretty, pretty clear. He was like, what are you going to do with your life? You know, like, he wasn't going to let me settle in, you know, and, and not take it further. While I was working for him and making music at night, I started taking classes at Art Center at night, which was a program that's open to the public. And I was able to get a scholarship to some of the architecturally focused classes based on the portfolio that I had been able to build while I was working for him. Because I was also on my own time taking the skills that he had given me and designing my own architecture and doing everything you know that I did for him. So making real plans and section and elevations for constructible buildings. There came a point in 2007, and at this point I'm like 24. <laughs> I went and I enrolled at Art Center, and that was a that was a big decision and a difficult decision because of the music, because I was getting pretty good and. The guys that mentored me in the in the music world were, you know, it was very clear that what we were doing in L.A. was was going to be something big. Yeah, I know a little bit about I never played an instrument, but I was present during a, a burgeoning creative scene, a music scene where there yeah. was just this electricity and this excitement and this build. And you just knew it was going to be something. And it's I'm sure it was really hard to be a part of that and be a major player in that and then have to extract yourself from it. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was difficult. And you know, I didn't share my music. I made thousands of songs and the only people that heard them were my mentors really. And a few pretty key people in the beat scene. Cause I wasn't really putting myself out there. So then the decision was either I'm going to take everything that I've done and start putting it out there like my peers, or I'm going to take this, design thing full force. Yeah, it really boiled down to the fact that I felt like I was going to have a much bigger impact 
creating the background for people's experiences as opposed to creating the background music for people's experiences. So I, uh, I got a scholarship to attend Art Center and I didn't like stop the music. I actually used to keep my MPC in my locker, you know, pulling all nighters. I would take about an hour and make music. You know, and that's kind of where I started the practice of designing and making music at the same time, because that led to me just plugging in my MPC in the computer lab, you know, while I was working on my projects and doing everything all at once. So then I was at Art Center for the next five years. I think you're supposed to graduate in three. (laughs) (laughs) Why were you there so long? Were you just working and taking classes or was it because you kept switching your focus or you just wanted to take as much stuff as possible? I'm not really made for like organizations and systems and things like that. I have trouble with with uh, following directions (laughs) 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 or following rules rather. So um, an example of that, I probably could have graduated earlier if I didn't take the same furniture class five times. There's one furniture class that's an elective and I took it five times because I loved making furniture after I made the first piece. I have the same story. I could have graduated in three years from San Diego State, but as soon as I found furniture design, I took a class every single semester, and it and it took me a few more years to graduate, but I was like, I can't leave yet. I don't know enough about furniture. I have to keep exactly. making furniture. Exactly. That was when I found it, you know? Mm-hmm. I came into Art Center with, like, a pretty clear understanding of who I was. It was hard for me to spend the time you know, doing the exercises that were designed to be searching, so to speak, for students. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I knew where my where my skills lay and I knew where I was going to be best able to express my visions. And that was in the 3D realm and in the shop. And I kind of took the approach of going above and beyond in the things where I knew that I had the opportunity while I was on scholarship at Art Center with those facilities to advance my knowledge to the point of being like astronomically good as opposed to being well-rounded. That's hard for an institution to take in. And obviously, you know, there's questions, you know, when I go into my fourth term review, which they have, Art Center is very hardcore. It's very competitive. So even if you get into Art Center, which is very difficult, there's a point where Art Center can tell you, look, you've been here for enough time for us to know this is not the place for you. (laughs) I remember that fourth term review was like, we see a lot of promise. You've got to pull this together because you're on the edge, you know? Yeah. And you guys know David Mukarski, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So David was my department chair. And David, you know, believed that there was more to come from me. And then I took my first furniture class the next semester. And that was the Bernhardt studio. And that was the first piece of furniture that I ever designed. I worked on that in a team with John Phillips and Stephanie Stocker, two of my good friends and former schoolmates. We won that and our piece went into production for Bernhardt and it introduced me to the world of design. And that's when I finally, this is like 2010 at this point, I'm 27. Finally, I I walked into ICFF and I was like, this is my tribe. (laughs) (laughs) You found us. We found you. (laughs) It was an amazing feeling, you know, because... I know up until that point, I thought, oh, I'm working on becoming an architect. I wanted to take the furniture class because it seemed interesting and seemed fun. And then it became an obsession. Furniture can become an obsession. So I need to know what a master's in luxury is, because that's kind of where you ended up. And that's also how you ended up in Switzerland, right? And can I just tell you, like, my cartoon version of a master's in luxury is like, this is how you ride in a private jet. This is how you eat caviar. This is how you bust the cork on the Moet. Like, this is... (laughs) That became a lot of it for me. (laughs) Not the private jet part, but honestly, moving to Europe and dealing with these brands that are the height of luxury, I did have to reacclimate myself with etiquette. (laughs) The brands lay out, you know, three course meal for us. And 
and it's like you shouldn't use the wrong fork you should know what's proper especially since for them everybody knows these things in america it's a lot more relaxed mm. luckily i did cotillion when i was young <laughs> so what's the curriculum like in a master's of luxury so this is a it's a unique program mm -hmm. cal has cornered the market on luxury education i guess in that sense it's a crash course in how to design and work with the craftspeople and the people that are involved in the luxury industry so the masters of luxury is kind of a misnomer i think they're calling it now the masters in design for luxury and craftsmanship mm. Okay, that helps explain it. It's it's a misnomer calling it a master's of luxury because it's it's really more than anything about craftsmanship, which is a core element of the luxury industry, as opposed to what I learned at Art Center, which is a lot more commercial. You know, Art Center was like an industrial education. I learned how to make things. And at Ical, it was more about the elements that go into crafting the narratives that are part of the luxury world, as well as an understanding of how to design for an industry that still does things much in the same ways that they were done hundreds of years ago. So you got yourself a master's of luxury and probably got really well versed in the lost arts of, I don't know, glass blowing and upholstery and all these wonderful time honored traditions. Yeah. And, and then you become a professional designer and now you're working with a lot of that craftsmanship in your work. Yeah. Can you tell us some of the highlights of your professional career since you launched your own studio? So, obviously, Salone Satellite in 2016. That's the biggest highlight. I started working on that project with Terry as soon as I graduated. And just for our listeners, I want to remind you guys, Terry Crews talked about this collection on the Terry Crews episode. So, that's where you've heard this name before. The Salone Satellite was was really my debut in this realm because I, I, I started my business while I was at Art Center and I had done some, I'd done contract work with US brands. So I had some stuff out in the world before this, but the designer that you see today after having gone through the education at Ical, that was expressed in that collection, the Secret Garden collection in 2016 in Milan. That's probably the biggest highlight. It was an opportunity for me to take what I'd learned since living in Europe and apply it and apply it in a way that was not typical of most of my peers. There's something about, you know, not being from here that allowed me to break certain rules or I don't not know that I was breaking rules as I was breaking them. Like culturally, you know, there's a freshness when you are interpreting things as a cultural outsider. You have a perspective that's different than other people. So you don't get caught in the same ruts as everybody else. Yeah, exactly. And also it was thanks to Terry. It was the first time that I've ever put the skills that I'd been honing for so long to use just purely for a vision in my head. And it was the first time that I'd done anything that was leaning into the, the world of combining art and design. It's a beautiful collection and it must have been a wonderful opportunity to explore it to that depth and have a, another person who's helping to put energy into you to help you do what you do best. Yeah, I've been lucky in that regard. I mean, I've had quite a few very important people that took risks on me throughout the years and mentored me throughout the years. You must attract that into your life through your personality somehow. Somehow. I don't know how I, it happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to talk to you about your creative process because I'm wondering, you know, you seem to me like somebody, you've studied philosophy and mathematics. You have this engineering sort of technical part of your DNA. You've always been interested in how things work. And yet you're very aware that you don't work in the way that society or the institutions really want you to. Yeah. So your self-awareness and your ability to attract mentors is fascinating to me. Can you talk to me about your internal dialogue that you have with yourself during the creative process? Like, how do you know when you're onto something that's worth pulling at, a thread that's worth pulling at? Or how do you know when it's time to like scrap something and move in a new direction or take a break so that you can, I don't know, get a fresh 
perspective? My process is one that's kind of akin to when I'm designing something, it's like being on the football field. It's a matter of knowing that you've put in enough work and practice so that you don't have to think when you're playing. And it's all muscle memory and reaction. And that's the way that I design the concept. That's usually where something gets either, whether it's it's green lit or, or it gets scrapped in my head. The strength mm-hmm. of the concept and what it's communicating. If I believe in something and what I'm trying to communicate with it, then I go through the process of creating it. And once I get over that threshold, then I see it all the way through. And what that means is that for anything that I design, usually there are three or four fully designed alternative products, you know, for each one thing that gets seen. And then, you know, there's a process of looking at them and seeing which ones express the qualities of what I'm trying to say. My process is extremely fluid. I can walk you through it. Once I have a concept and I Mm -hmm. determine what it's supposed to feel like, um, I walk over to the shelf and I start pulling out records one by one and I find all of the records that have uh, songs on them that that have the same vibe of what I'm trying to get through in my product and then I take the record I put it on the record player and I let it play while I think sketch some ideas pace in circles until something crystallizes or I hear a sound or something that epitomizes what I'm trying to make in my design. And then I pull the record back and I sample it and I loop it. Whoa. And then I start the design process with that looping to continue to keep me inspired. I'll have that looping. I'll pull out books. I'll look at references. I'll sketch and then, or I'll start designing. And then it's a fluid process. I have a table where I sketch and cut materials and then I have a table where I have my synthesizers, my samplers and my turntables and my computer and it's like the cockpit of my spaceship and I just do everything kind of all at once. Oh, that's really interesting. I would like to know a little bit more about some of the challenges that you encounter with running your studio. I think the biggest challenge is the fact that my studio is me. (laughs) (laughs) you are your own biggest challenge challenge. (laughs) so um, oh my god you're like the toughest boss and the laziest employee (laughs) exactly exactly it's been an eventful couple of years for me with a lot of projects that have launched and a lot of projects that are coming yeah i'm doing it alone so (laughs) that's probably the (laughs) toughest thing is that i don't have any interns, employees, none of that stuff. So I've got to organize my time. I've got to make the trips. I've got to be at the shows. And I also have to design the stuff and make sure it's good, as good as I can make it. Yes. But I mean, that's also, that's a growing pain, right? Exactly. We like seeing you at all the shows. I lament the day and age when you send your employees instead of you. That's never going to happen. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> you, I don't know if you realize, but in, in order to have stuff at the shows, that means that I don't have a social life until I go to the shows. <laughs> oh, right. Yes. I, I know all about that. <laughs> and then you have to have so much social life in those four days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So you are an American who has Nigerian parents and you are living and working in Switzerland. So you're a citizen of the world. So do you feel like you have particular roots or do you feel rootless or do you feel like you're being pulled in all kinds of different directions and maybe talk a little bit about where those roots pull you toward or from? You mean in terms of like feeling at home or? Yeah, like home and like identity, like self identity or cultural identity. I lived in LA until I was 29. And most of that time I lived in Pasadena. And then I moved to Singapore and then I moved to Europe. So physically, like physical home, it's weird to say given that I just told you that I lived there for 29 years, but I don't feel that I have physical roots as far as home i don't uh, i don't get homesick i don't really get attached to where i'm currently living and i guess i feel like the world is the world is my home i can be anywhere 
And that's just in terms of like where my physical home is culturally and identity wise. I, there's just no question that my cultural identity is as a black man, you know, Nigerian and American, like an African American is that's culturally, that's what, where I come from. I guess for me, that's different than feeling like America is my home. It's also because I'm first, because I'm first generation, my parents left their home to get to America. I've left America and I haven't really, I haven't settled yet anywhere long-term, I don't feel like. And I think it's easier for me to have that perspective because my parents, there's not like generations that have lived in America. Also, the one thing that is to me very important and that defines and shapes who I am is that especially having like in reference to America is the fact that I grew up in American culture of the 80s and 90s in Los Angeles. That is greatly shaped who I am. The way that I grew up and the experiences that I've had around the world, the conclusion that I've come to is that there's not, you know, there's not that much difference between people. Yeah. Shared humanity. Exactly. Yeah, it's not easy to to get to the point where where you feel unity with with everyone, basically. And I don't know if it's the travel that has brought this about or the political climate that I grew up in. There's something about personally feeling like an outsider, being a black male growing up in America, growing up in L.A. during the time of like the riots and all of that, having the experiences that I've had and also like going to school from age 12 to 17 in a school where I was only one of two black males there and having those people be like my lifelong friends, you know, people that have, you know, a vastly different experience than me and being able to relate and connect, you know, from so many different backgrounds and being able to relate and connect Mm -hmm. and then coming here to Europe and having the same experience with the people from completely different backgrounds and being able to relate and connect. And those things make it difficult for me to really hold on to anything, you know, necessarily beyond recognizing how it shapes my worldview and makes me who I am. Outside of that, there's not really much identification to a place or uh, anything like that. It sounds to me like you're saying like the the roots and the branches of your tree are sort of growing through your relationships and your experiences more than a physical locale, more than a, a place on a map. Let's um let's talk about your future and I want to just, you know, zoom out from the artwork and the design for a second and talk yes. about big life questions. If we were to fast forward Many years from now, when your grandkids are in junior high and they have to write a biography on their granddad for homework. Yeah. What do you hope they might have to say about you? I would hope that they could pinpoint one thing that I did that inspired them to dedicate themselves to helping everyone else. Because that's the overall goal. Yeah. And you're very clear on your purpose and you are... Also very clear on your desire to transmit that purpose from generation to generation. Yeah, I think that's my job (laughs) here. Um, I think it's the point of humanity, actually. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Not everybody gets there, but... (laughs) uh, Yeah, I think, you know, I might as well work on, on doing that. You know, it's funny, my life, I went from feeling like everything I touched turned to shit to the exact opposite. As soon as I dedicated myself to doing things for the sake of everyone else. Hmm. That's amazing. And it's That's an internal thing. shift in perspective that really opened up your life for you. Completely. I mean, all of these mentors and like all of the stuff that has happened, I can't explain. I feel very fortunate. We'll say, and uh, that feeling of, all these fortunate things, these fortunate serendipitous events, you know, I, I might be true. It might not be true, but for me, they're connected to the fact that a, I feel like I can't be doing anything else. I feel like I was born to create things, but B, because the things that I create, I create them with the, at least with the hope that they will be a benefit to 
others and inspire others or allow others to escape from you know the mundaneness of everyday life speaking of creating things is there something that you aspire to create or you'd like to do in the future a temple wow <gasps> yes I don't, yes <laughs> i love that there was no hesitation there you just you knew exactly what you what you want to do yeah i'm working towards that there came a point where i realized that if i wanted to be an architect and build temples and build these spaces to affect people's uh lives and affect people's spirits that if I wanted to be an architect and do that, I'd have to do five years of architecture school. And then I'd have to like toil as an architect until I was like 70 years old before anybody would let me do that. <laughs> on the flip side, being a designer and focusing on things at, at the smaller scale, the scale that people touch, you know, you end up piecemeal slowly affecting people's experiences with the things that they touch and it allows you to have the trust to do bigger and bigger things as you go so in that way i hope that i'll be able to build a temple that i will instill enough trust in people to allow me to build some sort of spiritual space before i reach 70 years old <laughs> <laughs> well i hope so too and i'm already planning my pilgrimage so you better get to it <laughs> So are you working on anything right now that you can talk about or give us a sneak peek of? So much secrecy in my life <laughs> regarding that. Um, yes. Are you familiar with Say? Say Collections? Yes. Oh, that's such a perfect brand for you. It is a perfect brand for me. And I have been chosen by Say to design collection number four. That is so Ooh. exciting. Oh. If you, you know Say Collections, you know that um, they've only worked with three designers so mm -hmm. far and uh, three noteworthy designers so far. So, yeah, it's very high end luxury and they're very exclusive. Well, congratulations on that. I guess uh, the best thing we can do is stay tuned to your website and social media. Do you want to tell us where our listeners can find you? My website is designbyeni.com, designbyeni.com. Be wary of designsbyeni.com. I don't know who that is or why they have that site. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's strange. You can find me on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash designbyeni, and on Instagram at Eni Archibald. I wonder how many people are going to stop in Tony George's architecture farm and ask for an oh apprenticeship after this. <laughs> yeah, you better warn him. That would be amazing. I'll, I'll write him an email and let him know. But yeah, that was that was ten years ago, which is crazy to think. I mean, I just graduated recently, so. Well, congratulations on your rising star. We're we're super stoked. Thank you very much. I am so excited that he told us about how he uses his synthesizer and beat making in his creative process. I love that. I do too. And now I'm like, oh, maybe I need to just make some crazy stuff and listen to it while I paint or something. Maybe it'll inspire me in some way. What I really enjoyed hearing about him, but now I feel like I know him a lot better, is, is his thinking he had to do something or be some sort of, you know, business person or listen to what other people were telling him he should be doing as his career or what kind of things he should study in school. And his consistent like disruption of that, um, you know, I think it was like a rebellion of some sort, but he didn't really know why he was doing that and he really didn't have a way to like channel that energy and I, but what I really did appreciate is that he learned really quickly in his 20s like that he needed to stop listening to what other people were telling him to do or thinking that, you know what's right for him and he needed to discover where he wanted to go and to just kind of roll with what made him happy. And a lot of people don't get there for a really long time. And a lot of them are like halfway done their, their career before they realize that. Cutting class to, to spend time at the potter's wheel is a beautiful example of like, I'm not sure why I need to do this, but I know I need to do this. So I'm going to break this rule to do it. 
but I can't really come clean about it because I know then people will take it away from me. And or make me feel like or steer steer me in another direction and say, oh, no, you don't really yes. want to do that. You really want to, you know, be a, a doctor or an accountant or whatever. One of the things about Eni's situation that's a little bit unique is that he was able to discover these mentors in his life that really gave him you know opportunities that other people may not have given him you know he's got the ceramics teacher the architect and terry cruz you know given all those opportunities to to let him be who he wants to be and i i don't think that there's i don't think that experience it is similar for a lot of other people and I feel like one thing that we might be missing more of these days are patrons of the arts. It used to be like a big deal if you had a lot of money to like, you know, help young artists by purchasing their work and keeping them going. But I just don't feel like that's a thing that happens as much these days, or at least it's not something that's very public. But I really wish there were more people like Terry Crews who are saying, OK, I'm successful and I want to really help all of these other people be successful. But I want them to do what they love and have passion about it. I don't want to give them all these restrictions to do like, you know, here's a budget and here it has to look like this or it has to be like that. I just want them to do what they love and make it amazing and support that. You know what? You know what I'm impressed by is I do think a lot of people have would-be mentors cross their path. But I think what Eni did is he was engaged enough to actually sink into that mentorship relationship, to actually l engage with it and let it happen. Mm. You know? I shudder to think of all the... I mean, I've had some wonderful mentors in my life, but I also shudder to think of all the would-be mentors that I just didn't engage with. Oh, like the opportunities that you could have had if you had either been more receptive. Yes. Or less oblivious. Yeah. You know, I think I was more, I was more defensive, I think when I was a teenager. So I think, you know, some of the teachers who may have recognized creativity in me, I, I maybe didn't act on that because I was like, I thought I was better than them or I thought I knew everything. You know, I was like a smart ass teenager. But I feel like he he didn't. He was just like, I'm going to do this thing because I have this opportunity and I, I really enjoy doing it. Yeah, he's a true seeker, I think. Don't you think? I do. Actually, I was really impressed with the fact that he like taught himself architecture. <laughs> like I he know. stayed in the dorm <laughs> and got a bunch of books on architecture and pretended he was still in school, except he taught himself his own curriculum. I mean, that really <laughs> takes like serious commitment, but it also shows how driven he is and what thirst for knowledge he has when it's something he really, really loves. He really enjoys. Um, and I, I just hope everybody has the opportunity to cultivate something in them that's kind of calling out to them thanks for listening please subscribe to us on apple podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and go to cleverpodcast.com to sign up for our newsletter read the show notes and see images of eni's work be sure to connect with us on twitter instagram and facebook at clever podcast we love hearing from you guys and if you're inclined to leave us a review on itunes it really helps us out and spreads the word of good design to more people this episode of Clever was edited by Chris Modal of Your Studio with music by L1011.